Hi everyone, my name is Rainer and you are here on Rainier Books on Booktube. It's Sunday, Sunday the 20th of February and I'm walking inside Haga Park which is one of the larger parks here in the Stockholm region and I thought I'd take you out today to a little walk through this beautiful park and speak about my reading. This is my like my comeback video because I haven't done videos for almost two weeks now and it feels like a comeback and I thought to take you to do this comeback with you we're going and walking through Haga Parken so welcome 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 So Haga Parken was actually started by King Gustav III. He was very interested in architecture, he was very interested in culture, and here at Haga, where I'm now, he wanted to build a summer palace more magnificent than Sweden had ever seen. He was heavily involved in the Haga project, sketching his own designs for the park and buildings, and took inspirations from his travels in Europe. He bought the rectory of Haga in 1771 as a place where he could live a simpler and more informal life. In 1785 the king also purchased the neighboring estate of Brahelund. These two properties today make up Haga Park. King Gustav III had the landscape reshaped and new buildings added here using the leading architects, artists and craftsmen of his time. And that's where I'm now and still like 250 years later Haga Park is one of the great attractions, one of the, actually, I think the biggest park seen in uh, the uh, surface and in the area here in the whole of uh, Stockholm. And uh, it's one of the best preserved historical parks, not to mention one of the world's leading English parks. And this style of parks developed in the mid 18th century, modeled on nature and the cultural landscape. It was a reaction against earlier garden ideals with strictly formal layouts. Haga is part of our shared cultural heritage here in Sweden. The park and its buildings are listed historical monuments managed by the National Property Board of Sweden. The Royal Jurgården administration is responsible for maintaining the park and Haga has formed part of the Royal National City Park since 1995. Let's go there and let's talk about books on the way. Speaking about my reading the last two weeks, because it's two weeks since I made my last Sunday sum up, some things always happen, or sometimes things happen in life. And two weeks ago, in, in the middle of the week, my daughter, my younger daughter, was uh, admitted to the hospital, and uh, I was pretty worried about her because she fainted, she had a headache, and you know, you always fear worse things happen, but then she was brought with an ambulance to the hospital and after 13 hours of waiting they found out that it's not that bad, it's, it's a migraine um, with aura as they say and uh, I was relieved but I had two, I lost almost two or three days because of that because I was staying up all night and always trying to get some information from her because uh, no one is allowed to the hospital or was allowed to the hospital with her because of the Covid pandemic and then I was super tired the next day and had to take almost like two days until I finally got um, fit again and last week it was a lot of work so uh, the reading wasn't like that and also things happen in this world but um, since this is a mixture today I'm at a very beautiful place right now so I'm gonna show you around a little bit. Here we are at a place called the Great Lawn which is not so visible right now because there's a lot of snow on the lawn. Um, as I said, this is an English landscape garden, a reaction against the formal symmetry of the Baroque gardens and the new ideals that developed in England around the mid-18th century were based around nature and the pastoral agricultural landscape and that's why we see this uh, landscape architecture here that built a huge lawn which is wide and which is today used by many families and children using their sleighs and having fun in the winter. Okay. 
I finished one book last week, actually on Friday, and that is the first book that was published this year, and that is Brown Girls by Daphne Palasi Andriades. This is a debut novel, a debut novel without much of a plot actually. It's about brown girls, girls of, with um, an immigration background who live in Queens and New York, who come from whose parents come from all parts of the world, from Africa, from Asia, from South America. And they are brown girls, they have different names. The names are very often mentioned in this book by uh, the author. But this book actually doesn't have much of a plot. It is told uh, over the 220 pages in the first person uh, plural. It's like we grow up, you know, we grow up, we go to college, we have brown boys as boyfriends, we have white boys, we marry, we... It, it's insightful in a lot of respects that it's really showing us the world of... Um, of black, brown, yellow, whatever, girls, brown girls, as they're called in the book, but it's... In the end, I think it's too long, even the 220 pages. I thought this would have been a nice short story, over 20, 25, 30 pages. I got tired um, from the middle on and onwards. So it's a nice story and I think maybe I'm the wrong target group because I'm an old white man, you know. And this is about young brown girls and young brown women. So I think the target group is more the um, the, the group of, of younger uh, migrants in the United States and people who grow up in the United States with different backgrounds and there's a lot of funny stuff inside, very good observations, um, also f obviously about discrimination but not so much actually, it's more about the fun and the empowerment and the greatness of being a brown girl from Queens in New York and as I said I would give this uh, Three, week three out of five stars because it was not my kind of book. Maybe it's your kind of book. This is Brown Girls by Daphne Pal <laughs> Brown Girls by Daphne Palasi Andriades. And here's the Great Lawn from down below. The sun is about to go down very soon. No, not very soon, but in the next 45 minutes, so I don't have so much time anymore to show you around in the beautiful Haga Park. Oh. Oh. Well, okay. <laughs> Welcome to the cave here in Haga Park. This cave is, is not a natural cave, it was built in the 1780s and the meaning was to, to build this cave artificially through this rock, through this little hill to the other side so that the uh, stables could be supplied with water. So that's the reason why they make the cave, which the cave today is a part of the national ancestry and is protected here. So this is one of the many things you can see here at Haga Parken. Slowly the day Light hours go away, but it was still a lot lighter now than it was three or four weeks ago in the middle of December when it's November, when it's really worse here, the worst possible weeks to come here because we have so little daylight. People still on the lake. It's not that cold. It's around minus one, minus two degrees. But here you can see a father with his son or daughter, I can't see that right now, uh, walking over the lake. And hopefully they will be well, they probably are. Sometimes accidents happen here, of course. And it's such a nice area, isn't it? The trees are so beautiful, the air is pure, and I'm just like 10 minutes outside the city of Stockholm. So back to the books, I finished Brown Girls. And I'm still reading the books that I have on my TBR for February. And if you're interested in which books I have on my TBR, 
not only for February but also for March and April and May and even June. You can always watch the comment section down below the description box where I have the current TBR. But things have changed. I'm still reading uh, the remains of the day by Kazuo Ishiguro. Haven't come that far yet. I'm still reading We Want What We Want, short story collection by Canadian American writer Alex Olin, and I really enjoy it very much. I have, will definitely make a single review about this short story collection that she published last year. I'm still reading The New Age of Empire by Kahindi Andrews, but things happen in the world, and I know that not many people like to be as political as I am sometimes, but I am, and I can't do anything about it. So things are happening in the world. When I wrote my, my Emmy thesis, oh my god, that's 30 years ago, I wrote my Emmy thesis about the German-Swedish writer Peter Weiss. And uh, he wrote in the 1960s a lot of plays. He wrote, I don't know the English titles now, he wrote Die Verfolgung und Ermordung Jean-Paul Marat, dargestellt durch die Schauspieltruppe des Hospizes zu Charenton unter Anleitung des Herrn de Saat. And he wrote Die Ermittlung, about the Auschwitz trial in Frankfurt. He wrote Vietnam Discourse, about the war in Vietnam. And he wrote Der Lusitanische Popanz, about colonies and the Portuguese colonial power in Angola and Mozambique. And he said in the 60s, asked why he is doing this kind of theater, documentary theater, he said, and that was the title of my, I used the quote as the title of my work, my thesis, he said, because the world of facts is so dominant right now, and we are in a time right now, again, at least for me, where the world of facts, the world of the things that happen around us are so dominant that I can't escape easily into fiction, which I sometimes want to do. All of us want to do that from time to time, and a lot of times, right? But right now, what keeps me from reading a lot of fiction these days is are the things that are happening around us. Not around us, but not so far away. It takes from Stockholm, if you want to go to the Ukrainian capital of Kiev, it takes about two and a half hours flight from here. And right now, as you know, as you all know, the Ukraine is surrounded by I don't know, nobody knows exactly, 130,000, 150,000, 170,000, maybe 190,000 Russian soldiers who have surrounded Ukraine from all sides, Vladimir Putin, the Russian president, and his friend Alexander Lukashenko, two of the last big dictators in Europe. They are threatening this uh, to, to start a war. They say they don't, they have, don't have any idea, they don't want to do anything, but it's still a very large possibility and the Western leaders all believe that Russia will attack these days. So I think the world of facts is so dominant and I watch a lot of videos about it. Uh, I try to, to read essays. I listen to Timothy Snyder from Yale University who's one of the great scholars about Ukrainian history and the history of Eastern Europe, very highly recommended. I can link down below lectures by uh, Timothy Snyder and other scholars. So should I go to the Chinese temple or is that, uh, is that too far away? Nevertheless, so I thought I have to change my TBR and, and because I watch a lot of things, but I also want to read. And maybe last week when I made this, no, 10 days ago when I made this video with the four books that I wanted to order, that I wanted to get, two books about uh, Vladimir Putin and one, two books about China. Uh, you have, if you have seen that video, you know what I'm going to talk about because I already got Masha Gessen's uh, book, The Man Without a Face, The Rise of Vladimir Putin to Power in Russia. And I started reading this uh, because I want to understand more and I know that Masha Gessen is one of the most prolific and toughest and best writers to um, deliver such a story. And she has done, or they have done, as, as I have to say now, they have done a meticulous research on the subject. And the book was published in 2012. And as I said, it's called The Man Without a Face. And I also got Catherine Milton's book. Putin's People, which is uh, a book about the uh, oligarchs around the pre Russian president. 
who support him, who sort of are his power base, and what does he want? And, and uh, I'm hoping to find out a little bit more about him reading these titles by Masha Gessen and Catherine Belt. Then, today, today, the Olympic Games in Beijing will end, finally, luckily. And I haven't seen anything of the sports happening there. I said I'm going to boycott it, and I succeeded. Not read any news about it, and some headlines, of course, but not any article, nothing, because I am still outraged about the fact that Olympic Games are held uh, in a country like China, which is has a government that is suppressing its own people, suppressing other minorities, and killing people we don't know how many. And I also got this book, which I started to read yesterday by Joanna Chu, a Canadian, uh, Chinese-Canadian journalist who has lived in Hong Kong and in Beijing. And she published her book, China Unbound, um, about the new world disorder that is planned by President Xi. And that's what I have started as well. So my TBR is changing due to current events, I think. And that's, I think, something, at least for me, uh, that can happen when things happen in the world. So a little bit more of Haga Park and, and then we're out of here. We've come to a little island in the lake, and this little island was designed by architect Friedrich Magnus Pieper and King Gustav III when the southern part of Haga Park was laid out in the 1770s. Uh, they widened a ditch to surround the former um, promontory with water, and the idea was to create a castle, an hermitage on the southern point of the island. Instead, a small summer pavilion was set up here. So that is on the island in front of us. The Royal Cemetery was established in 1922 and now covers the whole island. The bridge and cemetery were designed by Ferdinand Boberg, whose other works include Rusenbad, which is the government chancellery, and NK, the department store, right in the middle of Stockholm. Crown Princess Margareta, wife of the future King Gustav VI of Adolf, was the first member of the royalty to be buried here in Haga Park on this island. Rida Holman Church, the traditional venue for royal ceremonies and funerals, no longer had space for dignified new royal graves. The church was already the last resting place of 17 Swedish monarchs and their families, so now royal members of the royal family rest here in peace. So that was most of the reading week, and uh, future videos that I intend to make is one of the videos I intend to make is about banned books in the United States, because this really upsets me a lot when I read about school boards banning books from the curriculum, books that are forbidden in the US. And, um, whoa, slippery, slippery here. Um, I will do a video about this and about the movement that's behind it a little bit. Talk about that and talk about books that are forbidden in some school boards in the United States. Because I come from a country where books were burned in 1939 in the Reichs Kristallnacht and it was the German poet Heinrich Heine who lived in the 19th century Heinrich Heine who said that in a place where books are burned and they were burned in the United States I saw these books burning in a place where books are burned they will burn people not so much later. And, well, with a couple of views from Haga Park, and I will say goodbye for now, and I see you very soon on this channel. But don't go away, because there are some nice pics coming from the park.
look at this. I'm building new houses here in the outskirts of the city at Nortel and a house a side house with like eight or ten stores. This doesn't look too nice. I'm pretty sure these are millions of Swedish crowns, hundreds of thousands of euros to live one of, in one of these homes. Move and look at this phallic tower. Wow. For Swedish relations it's pretty high. For Tokyo it's not more than a little tinder stick. <laughs> 